family here, and uh, you heard of the singing Von Trapp family? We have the Fraser family, and uh, yeah, we have. They are. Uh, that's. It's ten of you all together. That's ten. Isn't that awesome? Ten. Come on, put your hands together for ten. And uh, I was ministering up there in Roanoke, Virginia. They had a church there. We did a small revival there. But they have since gone on the road. They have uh, literally, they're on the road. And they're going from place to place. They bring the whole family. They share the word of God. They've been at this a long time. But they have a beautiful family. And they're going to present a song tonight. Um, so if you just please come up and grace, where'd she go? She's going to work this all out, right? Come on, and we can take care of this. Come on, put your hands together. Everybody's coming to sing. It's going to be awesome. This is Rebecca Frazier, the mom. And I wish I could say I know everybody up here, but I, I, I one time I do. Okay, guys, this is going to be wonderful. Everybody got their mics? Do you need another mic? No, we're good. Are you sure? Okay, wait a minute. Everybody give your name. Catriel. Kerstin. Kaysen. Kays. Kagan. Rebecca. J. 
Jesse. Kaylee. Wow, come on, Dad. And this is the dad. Come on, Dad. Come on, Dad. This is Marshall. Pastor Marshall, God bless you. God bless you. You got a wonderful family. And Karina, the oldest, is in Spain with YMAM working with Andrew Kettner. Your, your, your uh, number two, your son, is going to Bible school, no, going to Christ for Nations? He is, yes. Isn't that awesome? And so they're taking off. And I just, I just love their heart. They got a big heart. You get around these people. I think they had, uh, what's the, the drama team? New life drama. New life, and they were just packed in their house, and they they just keep low key. You know, people, kids running everywhere, dogs, this and that. They just relax, you know, just easy going. Don't sweat a thing. Hallelujah! I learned a lot being in your house. I just. <laughs> I don't know. I think that night that we served you dinner at like eleven o'clock, there was like twenty people in our house. Is it twenty? Yeah, and just people moving around. I said, "Ah, it just feels like a commune here. It's a wonderful, a Christian commune." But I love it. I love your kids. They all have vibrancy for Jesus. They got a smile, and we love you. That was powerful. Is that your song? Is that someone else's song? It was powerful. Never heard it before. Miracle. Faith sees. Faith sees a miracle. Faith is looking for a home. You got that now, Grace? <laughs> well, listen. Let's give them a hand. And we love you. Tremendous. We love you. Hey, guys. And Marsha's going to come up and just share just a little bit. Then I'm going to preach. She's going to share just for a couple of minutes, just share about what they're doing, where they're going, the heart they have for missions. And so this is a missionary family in Jesus' name. A lot of love in this family. They just flow together. They keep their acting. So, Marshall Frazier, come on up here. We got your pulpit, brother. Praise the Lord. Give him a hand as he comes. Love you. Bless you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. So, he said, I only have about 30 minutes. So, uh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, no, I am, I am so honored to be here. We love this church. We love, we love the people of this church. One of the, one of the greatest things that I'm so honored by Pastor Merrick, even last night we came to the missions meeting, and one of the greatest things that his heart is he wants everyone involved in the ministry. He does, it's not about him. That's the greatest pastor in the world. When they think it's about themselves, they run away. Amen? Because, I mean, I, when, we, when we had the encounter, was it counter, encounter? I can't talk about it, right? But I'm going to talk about it anyway. When we, I won't, I won't. When it's counter weekend, everybody I talked to had their own 501c, had their own ministry. And I'm like, what is this church? This is crazy. Anyway, it was so awesome. So I'm so honored to be here, and I appreciate you letting me share a few minutes. But, um, um, you know, one of the biggest things, you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you my failures this church has been a blessing to us. Y'all don't know how much this church has blessed us. One of your guys in this church has given me close to $4,000 over the last four years. And uh, that's how we came to this church by this guy. And he's an amazing man of God. We love him dearly. And uh, you know what happens when, something, when God blesses you sometimes? You quit praying. Because you have all the money you need. And it's like, God, I, I've got this now. God goes, good luck. Have fun with that. And what happened to me? I had fun with it. But um, I was reading a book this week by Michael Yeager. If you haven't found Dr. Michael Yeager, look him up. He's an amazing man of God. He has seen God do great things. And somebody asked him, and he, I was so glad about his honesty in his book. He said this. He goes, um, how come you don't see the stuff that you talk about all the time? He goes, Some, and he said in his book, I was so proud of this guy's honesty. He goes, sometimes I don't spend time with God that I should. And so about two years ago, we started seeking God more because I was, okay, I'm tired of this mess. This is not working. Whatever we're doing is not working. Let's do something else. We started seeking God. And is there a clock back? I'm trying to watch the time. Is there a, uh, what, what time did I start? 7.40? So I got, no, just kidding. Anyway, um, anyway, and so I'm trying to, trying to watch it. Anyway, uh, I joke a lot too. Like, Pastor Merrick, have fun. He's biting his fingers. He's nervous now. Anyway, um, <laughs> he's never nervous. Anyway. I'm part-time comedian. Um, anyway, but we, um, so about two years ago, I started seeking God more. We started praying three hours a day, four hours a day. My family, we spent 10 hours one day in worship and prayer, just seeking after God, saying, okay, God, what are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? Because I'm tired of doing it myself. I need you in my life. I mean, all the money in the world doesn't do nothing for me if you're not leading me. 
Amen? I can have all the money in the world, but who cares if God's not showing what the next step? Because the next step is the most important step. Because if you're going the wrong way, you're going to miss God's greatest blessings. Anyway, and so I, so we started seeking God as a family, and I started pressing in. I started pressing hard. God, I need you. God, I'm tired of this. This is not working. I need more of you. And we started going after God, and uh, God started ministering me. He started giving me dreams, started giving me visions, started talking to us. And it was so cool how my wife and I were, were praying together, and God was telling us both things. And, and one time in prayer, one morning, we're going through the New Testament, and one morning in prayer, God, we read Acts 9 about when, uh, when Paul was going to find people in the way, and all of a sudden it dropped in my heart, that's the name of your ministry, the way. And I thought, oh, whatever, I've got a name of the church. I'm not going to change my name, whatever. And if I talk too fast, please forgive me. Uh, anyway, so I'm going to go on. Anyway, and so later that day, I told my wife that, and she goes, I thought the same thing this morning. So we changed the name of our church to the way church. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just making stuff up as I go. Anyway, and so I'm okay, God, I'm going to follow you. We changed the name of our church. And we kept praying, kept praying. God kept giving me stuff, giving me stuff, giving me stuff. And, uh, and over the process of time, God started showing me what we're supposed to be doing. And, uh, and so we're, we're now the way missions. We're going to be missionaries to Costa Rica at some point when it opens up, whenever it opens up. But uh, we're going to, amen, amen. But um, Isaiah, and when we left, when we left Roanoke, somebody prophesied over us, and a lady friend was praying over us. She said this, Isaiah 30, 21, you will hear a voice behind you. This is the way walk ye in him. And at the time, I didn't process it. This morning in worship and prayer, when a family was praying together, it hit me. This is the way. Wait a minute. That's the name of my ministry, the way. Okay, it's cool. Acts 9, Paul was headed to find people in the way. Acts 24, Paul defended himself and said he was following according to the way. He even said that. That was what they called Christians before they're called Christians. They didn't know what to call them. They're just the way, the, the, the way people. They thought they were a sect, something crazy. Are we crazy? Um, and Isaiah 30, the Hebrew word is, and I'm not a Hebrew, so I don't understand. I don't speak Hebrew, but it's Derek. It's not Derek, it's Derek, or I don't know. Anyway, it, um, don't you want to speak Hebrew? Okay, no one does. Good. Then I'm right then. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> that's what I tell my wife all the time. Anyway, and um, it, which means a way or a path which one goes very frequently. Acts 9, the Greek word is hadas, which denotes a course of conduct, a way of thinking, feeling, and deciding. We want to travel and teach people how to follow the way. I'm going to end with this story. Uh, Four or five weeks ago, I got up one morning. I worship God every morning. I wake up at 4 a.m., worship God a couple hours. I go back to sleep for maybe an hour until my kids wake me up or whatever. And uh, so I'm worshiping God every morning, trying to spend time with him every day. We spend hours every day with our family worshiping God. Because the more time you spend with him, the more he influences your life. And the more time you spend with him, the more you can hear his voice. So about four or five weeks ago, I get up in the morning, and I, I'm getting ready. And I go take a shower, and I put my hand in the shower curtain to open it up, turn the water on, walk away, let the water get hot, get stuff, you know what it is. So I grab the shower curtain, and I haven't said this in a long time. I used to say it a long time ago. I used to say, good morning, Father. Good morning, Jesus. Good morning, Holy Spirit. And I haven't said that in a long time. I just said it, good morning, Father. And, and all of a sudden, when I said that, this faith rose up inside of me like, this is going to be an awesome Sunday. I'm like, this is going to be a good Sunday. I mean, I wasn't even preaching. It's still going to be a good Sunday. I don't have to preach to be a good Sunday. Amen? Just Jesus has to show up. I'm going to be a good Sunday. So I post something on the Facebook. This is going to be a good Sunday. Y'all should come to church today. We get to church in the middle of worship. I saw myself laying hands on the sick and the sick getting healed. Okay, cool. I'm not the pastor. I'm not going to do anything. Seconds later, the pastor got up and had an altar call for healing, and people started getting healed in the church. Guess what the title of her service was that morning? Good morning, Holy Spirit. Dude, God, how do I see that every day? How do I teach people to see that every day? It's all about relationship with the Father. It's not religion. It's not goofiness. It's just getting to know God more. And we want to teach people how to follow in the way. Just be like Jesus. Just walk like Jesus. Jesus said we can do the same works as him in greater works. Was Jesus ever transported? Not that we know of. But Philip was. Was that something greater than what Jesus did? Y'all look at me like I'm weird right now. In the Bible, y'all read the Bible? In the New Testament, when Jesus, not when he was dead, when he, was, when he rose from the dead, he was, anyway, when he was alive, was he moved from one place to another in the Bible? He was? Tell me. Tell me. I don't know. I never saw it. Where was he? He walked across the water. Okay, don't mess me up. Anyway, <laughs> hush the crowd. Okay, one time, one time, come on. Forget my story, forget my story. 
You got to, these people read the Bible too much. Anyway, okay, you're right. I forgot about that story. Okay, I'm done. Anyway, the point is we can walk like Jesus if we get to know the Father. Get to know the Father. Spend time with the Father. You're doing 21 days in fasting. It's not just a scam. He's not doing it just to have fun. He's doing it to push you guys into getting to know the Father more. Because Pastor Mark wants a church full of men and women of God. He don't want a church full of him, a church of full people full of God. Amen? So I want to encourage you guys today, get to know God more. Spend time with him. Worship him. Love him. Just love Father. And let me tell you something. It doesn't matter how much you give, how much you pray, whatever it is. You get to know God more. He'll tell you what to do more. He'll tell you to give more. He'll tell you to spend more time with him. He'll tell you what to do. So don't get stressed about it. Just worship God. Let God lead through you, and he'll bless your life like crazy. Amen? God has the greatest blessings ready, waiting for you to follow him. Amen? The, the, one more story. I lied. I'm sorry. I wasn't going to say this, but I am. Matthew 19 tells a story of the wealthy man that struggled to give up everything to follow God. He says, I follow the rules. Jesus said, you don't know me, though. You can follow the rules. You don't know me. Give up everything. Come follow me. The guy walked away. He doesn't know behind his back. Jesus had the biggest gift ever ready waiting for him. He had the biggest gift. It's not necessarily money. He had the biggest life ready for this guy. The best life ever. You can live your best life now to steal it from somebody famous. You can if you give up everything to follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. We give up everything to follow God, and we're so excited about it. It's awesome to follow God. It's such a blessing to follow God because he's going to bless us more and more. And if you will follow God, God will bless your life. Whatever it is you're supposed to do, you can be doctor, lawyer, missionary, pastor, teacher, list of things. It doesn't matter what it is, but God will give you the greatest blessings if you give up everything to follow him. Amen? Follow God with your life. Don't do anything else because nothing else matters. You're going to miss the greatest blessings if you don't follow God. I can promise you, give up everything and follow him. He'll bless you. Amen? Amen. Amen. We agree. We agree for your family that is going to be blessed. Why don't we, let's just, just get, Rebecca, come up here. Break, come up here, Rebecca, and, and come back up here. We just want to pray a blessing on you. Uh, these guys are very sincere to pressing into God. You're a graduate of Norval Hayes Bible School, is this right? And, uh, Jer and you're part of Jerry Savelle's Bible School. So they're, these have a heart for missions. Their kids are wonderful. They love God. And let's just release our faith for them, shall we? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that things are prepared. And Lord, you, and we believe that open doors are coming to them while we go through this COVID thing, and that, Lord, they'll be released to fulfill the call of God in Costa Rica. Lord, we just call down a supply. We call down open doors, open, uh, literally open doors, opportunity of uh, coming out to you in Jesus' name. And the Lord, your provision will be there. The anointing shall increase. And the Lord, as they honor you to seek you first, we know you're going to honor them with great moves of God. And open things are happening in services that they will be part of leading into the glory of heaven. Thank you for them, Lord. Bless every child. Bless their next steps, Lord. And we declare an increase over their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, sir. We love you both. Love you guys. Let's give them a hand. Praise the Lord. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yeah, they're, they're, I'm a little jealous where they're going. They, they have an adventure in store in Jesus' name. Amen? And uh, may I see? My son got me hooked when we had a, some days away on this show called Alone. You ever heard of it? They stick these people in the wilderness, and they give them like 10 things they get to pick. And whoever stays the longest wins a half a million dollars. And so what happens is they start, you know, some people quit the first day. They hear a bear growl, then they quit. <laughs> they tap out. Then some people last two days. And, uh, but this guy who won, it just is a great analogy of life. He was a Baptist missionary for 15 years. And I guess his wife and them had separation of three kids. But I'm going to get this for my kids. And he was the, like the least outdoor guy you'd ever want to see. 
And he was like, this guy ain't going to make it. He's just, he's doing everything wrong. I kept telling him what to do because I was coaching him. <laughs> but he wouldn't listen. Put, you know, lines in the water, lines in the water. Quit doing what? You're wasting time. What are you doing? And so finally, he gets lines in the water. And he's, he just keeps fighting. No matter what happens, he puts his nets out and these logs come tear up all the nets and he's got no nets. He built the net. He carefully built the net. Spend a week building the net, lay it out there, get crushed the next day. He says, I guess, I guess I'll have to do it again. But you know what came to me? I listened to him and you could tell he was praying. He was praying. And through it all, even though he seemed so weak, he kept praying and God would show him Dungy crabs are floating in the kelp. Go get them. So he started doing that. Then you could catch fish if you do this. Start catching. So pretty soon he was set. Isn't that cool? And every expert in the entire ten fell off. I mean, one guy, he had a cabin, tables. He had, I mean, he had, he had everything. Like This guy was like, wilderness is nothing for me. I'll turn wilderness into a, into a palace. Well, he taps out. He gets bored. So this Baptist one, hallelujah, through adversity, I thought, you know, God, it's like in life. You get pushed back, slapped down. Seems like nothing's going right. Nothing's going your way. But if you just keep trusting God, not let go of the rope, saying, God, I'm trusting you for the next day. Sometimes you just got to take the next step, put it forward. Next step, put it forward. God will come through for you. In every life that's here, God's going to come through for you. In Jesus' mighty name. And God's coming through for the Frasers in Jesus' mighty name. And for everyone here, God, the vision God put in your heart, it's going to come to pass. It's going to come to pass. It's going to come to pass. Your family shall be restored. Your home shall be put back together. You're going to see finances come into your home. You know, and with uh, St Stoney here tonight. Stony stock building class is growing. Uh, he had, he had a, there's this crowd growing. And I, and I just thank you, uh, Stony. And people are going to get blessed. We're going we're gonna to have different kind of businesses. We're going to launch out, ministries launching out. I'm excited for everybody here. I really am. I am excited. Are you excited? Yes. Listen, man, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You're going to get excited. God's got good things for you. He's going to turn things around. And that's just, that's not just hype talk. That's what the Bible says. We've got the greatest encourager in the powerful Holy Ghost. So let's pray. Father, we just agree, even as we sow today, God, no matter what we're going through, no matter what the hardship, God, you've got our back. And all you want out of us is faith and obedience. To trust you, that we're hearing you, to flow in the Holy Ghost to take the next steps. And Lord, we believe that you can turn darkness to light. You can turn sorrow into joy. You can turn lack into prosperity. That God, that you're the God of the turnaround. We believe it. So thank you for your turnaround for everyone here tonight and those listening on internet. God has turned around for you in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's receive the tithes and offerings now. and We'll just go worship God with it. video of their house. Do you remember how we blessed them with a bus? Yes. 
We bless them with the bus. Let me show you what they're doing with the bus. I'm Rebecca, this is our bus. We, it's taken a great transformation. It had 55 seats in, or 55 passenger bus. It had all bus seats in here, just like a regular old school bus. And so, um, but we took those all out. We gutted it in every way. And- uh, They did this themselves, you sleep y'all. eight on here. It's a little, not too snug, but this was a design that my husband and I made because our little boys have got to have a bed. It can go out further, Kaylee. Um, our little boys have got to have a bed, and so it's a full size, it pulls out to the full size bed. Mm-hmm. And then there's storage right there for all their bedding. Coffee. Coffee is the most important thing. And a refrigerator. That's the electrical panel. Then we have our four girls each have bunk beds. And um, they sleep quite well. Uh, Everybody decorated to their own liking. There's a linen closet, it's very full. And back here, here's our instruments. We had thought it might be a shower, but we might even take a double thought on that to not use it as a shower because we definitely need the musical storage. Here's the bathroom. And light turns on. And we have two closets and more dressers. Then here's the master bedroom. <laughs> and you always have to have the fruit of the spirit. It's a reminder everywhere in this bus. When you have eight people in a bus living together, you have to walk in those. Have a good night. <laughs> You gotta have love, patience. <laughs> That's amazing. They did it all themselves. It's tremendous. So they're taking that uh, with them. They're traveling across the states with all the venues they, they're, they're, that they're doing. And they want to travel down to Costa Rica and live from the bus in Jesus' name. And. Uh, uh, oh, you're not taking the bus. Oh, I just. <laughs> bus stays here. <laughs> I pushed it too far. <laughs> Hallelujah. If they want to have their Bibles. You know, we're talking about the moves of God. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, talking about moves of God. Um, Stan Lovins is going to be here Friday. We're going to have a, he flows very powerfully, gifts of healings. We're going to have a lot of, believe in God for a lot of healings. And on Friday night, it'll be like a healing service. Bring your sick. But in John chapter 3, um, I want to just talk about John the Baptist a little bit and about his heart. And let's begin with verse 25 of John chapter 3. It says, Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. Talking about Jesus. Jesus' baptisms are outnumbering John the Baptist. And John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom 
who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. And he who is from the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. But he who comes from heaven is above all. And when he has seen and heard that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony, but he who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the Spirit by measure. Let's pray. Father, I pray you just help us as we come to a place of closer fellowship with you. Even as our brother talked about pressing into God. We want to press into God. We want to know you in a greater measure. We want to know you in your fullness. We want to know you in your presence. And we just ask for revelation even today as we hear your word in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. The focus I want to be is on the verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. You know, that goes against human nature. He must increase, but I must decrease. Think about it. John has been through not an easy time. He's eating locusts, wild honey. He wears a camel hairs. He's a rough, tough guy. I like John. Makes no excuses, doesn't apologize for his message. He tells it like it is. If you don't like it, leave. In fact, he says things that really are not secret sensitive. He calls people snakes. He looks at the Pharisees and says, you brood of vipers, who, who thinks you're going to escape the wrath to come? Not exactly a very secret sensitive message. But he was trying to shake them up, that people need to be in a in repentance. They need to be broken. They need to come to God. And he was the, the one to prepare the way for Jesus. To people who would get their hearts ripe for what Jesus had to say when he showed up. So then they tell him, hey, John, you've been the main man, water baptizing. Think about it. People would come to him, send leaders from the Jerusalem temple. Who are you? What authority do you do this? Who gives you authority to baptize in this water like this? Who do you think you are? And he said, I am a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make the crooked way straight, the rough places smooth, and I'm here to prepare the way for Jesus. And so he's the leading light before Jesus was revealed. He really is. And then Jesus actually shows up one time at the River Jordan, and he knows it. Before he's even getting to him, he tells his disciples, he says, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He recognized who he was because he was the last or let's put it this way. Jesus was the last prophet of the Old Testament. But he was the second to last. And Jesus said about John, there's not been a man greater than this man. In his purity, in his focus, in his purpose, he lived a life sold out for the things of God. He was a great man. John the Baptist, we need to talk about him all. A great man. And then Jesus said to him, you need to baptize me in, in this river Jordan. He said, Lord, you should be baptizing me. Who am I to baptize you? Because John knew who he was before any of the, of the disciples knew. No, and Jesus said, no, this is, it's got to be this way, that righteousness would be fulfilled, that God has ordained that I be baptized. And when John baptizes Jesus in the river Jordan, the Bible says, a voice from heaven came out from heaven and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. That's God the Father. And then the Bible says that, angel, I mean, that the Spirit of God fell upon him like a dove, which is a great illustration why there's not a Jesus only, there's not just one God. Amen? He's three in one. God the Father spoke, Holy Spirit descended, Jesus received. Amen? So then Jesus gets, filled, gets literally anointed by the Holy Spirit, and then everything that happened then on was miraculous. Nothing happened until he got filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. So then they separate their ways. Jesus begins to gather disciples to him, and he's ministering. John continues his ministry of water baptism. But things, things begin to change. All of a sudden, the crowds that John was drawing became less. In fact, we have people like Andrew was a disciple of John. And, and he chases after Jesus and says, I'm changing camps. I'm with the Jesus camp. I'm leaving John the Baptist, and I'm joining Jesus the Pentecostal. That's the joke. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so he goes over, 
and he brings Peter. And pretty soon the crowds are going. And pretty soon the word gets back to John through his disciples. Do you realize the crowds are much greater with Jesus than with you? And I love his attitude. John the Baptist talks about the reality of his role and his position. And he said these words. He must increase, but I must decrease. I tell you, those are words that will put your heart in a place of revival. Because really, that should be our words continually. He must increase. Jesus must take over my life in a greater and greater way. He must increase. But I must decrease. My abilities, my talents, my gifts, I've got to recognize that without God, I'm nothing. And I've got to learn this in the walk with God. I must decrease, but he must increase. Jesus said, there's not been a greater man than, than this prophet, John the Baptist. But then he says that he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Because John was never born again of the Holy Spirit. John was never filled with the Holy Ghost. We have the opportunity to be born again of the Holy Spirit and have God himself live on the inside of us. The Spirit of God came upon John the Baptist, but he was not born again. He was the last Old Testament prophet. Jesus actually is the last one. But he was the last one that fulfilled what God gave him to do. And he had the spirit of Elijah about him. I think my favorite prophet is, is Elijah. And I, like his, and, I, and I like his son, John the Baptist, because it tells it like it is. Hallelujah. We need some of that going on today. And so we have to understand this. If we're going to move into the things of God, and we talked about removing things that block the power of God and stop us from moving in the fullness that God has for us. And we need to recognize that what, that what he says, what John the Baptist said, was the very opposite of human pride and what human self-centered living is. It was the epitome of, the, of, the, of looking the other way. And this book has got so much to talk about through the apostles. How we've got to get that in us and get an attitude that I must decrease, but he must increase. The Bible says that we have this treasure. This is found in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. The Passion talks about we are nothing but a clay pot. And the excellency of the power is overflowing out of us. We have this anointing of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. This, this wonderful power of God that, that can be released to bring healing and bring deliverance. It's within us. But never forget, it's a clay pot. He talks about the fact that this vessel of flesh is nothing but a clay pot. Meaning that it can be destroyed. It can be taken out. But the excellency is of God. It's of God. And we've got to always remind ourselves that whenever we're doing for God, it's Him in us. And that we need to recognize that when we start taking things upon us like, that I think I've got this, I think I look what I can do, look, look, look what God's given me, we've got to be so, so careful. Because what happens, I don't think it's the big sins that separate us from God and from His presence. It's little things that get in the way. And that we don't get as close as we could and should. But God wants us close. And so we need to develop that, this heart of John the Baptist. That he said, you know what? It's not about, it's not me. It's him in me. And we more we focus on that. It's like pride pushes God away. Whenever you think that you're strong in yourself and your own, own ability. If you go to Judges 7. Judges 7 is a story about Gideon. And Judges 7, God tells Gideon, call up an army because I'm going to send you to defeat the Midianites that are taking over the land. Gideon was one of the judges that God picked out and anointed. So Gideon makes the call. 32,000 armed men show up. They're fighting the army of 120,000. And God tells them, it's too many people. Because you'll say if you win that you did it with your strength. Even though the odds are still four to one. 
He said, you got to take it down. So he had him. He said, whoever is afraid, whoever doesn't want to fight, please go home. 22,000 took off. He said, I believe him. He left down with 10. So he's got 10 against 120. Yet God says that's still too many. Now think about it with God's viewpoint. I don't want you ever to think it's you. When you think it's you, you're going to, what happens is you short circuit the power of God. His anointing, his power to put you over becomes shrunken and minimized. And this is the problem in the body of Christ. We think what happens is we can do church without the anointing. We can do church without God. Especially if you get big numbers, you got the budget, you got this going on, you got this, hey, we got a whole lot going on. Wait a minute. Where's God in all this? Oh, we don't need God. We can do this by ourselves. Well, what are you accomplishing? What are you really doing? And I always like to check up on ministers and say, where are you coming from? And I stay away from people that have the world on a downhill drag. I got this down. We got this. We got that. And you know, where ministers say, I won't, I won't even talk to you unless you have so many members. Oh, yes, there's a picking order out there. And what happens is we watch this stuff go on. It's so easy, guys, to get over into the flesh. It's so easy to get over into our position or our degrees and what we've accomplished. That's why sometimes trials, God will use them, that zero you out. It's like all your, all your smarts and everything is taken to zero. And I know what it was like, 1994. I, the doctors told me I'd die. I had 90 days to live. I had a tumor and wrapped around my whole body. And I had to walk this out with God. And I had to go through treatment, but it wasn't just the treatment's going to do it. It's going to be God's power to do it. And I remember getting so zeroed out, emotionally, physically, mentally, zeroed out. And I have to go to God. And I have to, because what my faith was, I'm never missing a sermon. I don't care if I've got to get three ushers to hold me up like this. I'm going to preach on Sunday morning. So here I am. I, I got a place in my life where I couldn't even study correctly. I'd fall asleep. I couldn't pray. I couldn't even do all my confessions that I wanted to do through my confessions because I'd speak the word of my life. Amen? And I remember... I'd come up to the pulpit in my own natural, unprepared, <laughs> weak, feeling totally inadequate. But here's one thing I had. I'm going to do it to obey God. I'd step up there. And, as, and it was a great lesson for me. And I always want to go back. For the Lord want to remind me I did it again. Listen, never forget that lesson. When I was at zero, this treasure is of God. It's not of us. The anointing of God would come. Revelation would explode. I'm sitting there listening to myself going, I didn't know that. That's amazing. It was like someone else was speaking. I felt like stepping away like this and looking at myself. And I said, you know what? That's not me. That's the power of God. It's not me. It's him. It's him. And it did it week after week. I got kind of used to it. Now you got to be careful. Because sometimes you get, I don't ever get sloppy in the ministry. Well, God understands you still up there. You got nothing to say. You've not spent any time with God and you got to be careful. There's that end where you don't prepare. But here's what the Lord told me. I don't care how much you fast. 
you pray, you study. You never lean on that. You lean on me. Let my grace be the one that flows out of you. Does that make sense? It's really got to be great. It's got to be God. Now, I'm not... Everything that's a balance to doctrine. Does that make sense? Yes, I'm the righteousness of God. Yes, I'm a child of God. Yes, I'm a son of God. But the flip side is there as well. Outside of God, I'm nothing. Without God, I'm not a son of God. Without God, I'm not a daughter of God. Without God, my sin's unforgiven. Without God, uh, do, do you understand? So, the, so Paul understood this. He said, don't promote a novice before their time because their pride will get a hold of them. All of a sudden, they think they're so mighty when they're still a spiritual pygmy. And you can watch, I've watched people get the call of God but they miss God because they don't want to go through the training process, the serving process, the breaking process. They want to jump up behind the pulpit and start preaching. And they tear up more than they fix. I've watched churches grow and blow up. I've watched wounded walk away bleeding. I've got to deal with them over here. They did what? They did what? And uh, Yonggi Cho has a word for it. He calls them spiritual green beans. You take a, a spiritual green bean and you put him out there, he'll just beat the sheep up. He thinks it's a new, you know, this is not a circus. We're not trying to whip the animals up on the stool. We're not trying to put a show, but I'm telling you, success can go to your head. And all of a sudden, you think it's you. The day you do is when you're dead. And so in our lives, you want closer to God. God has to deal with our pride issues. And always understand that we all deal with pride. And you will deal with it until you leave the planet. And the person says, I have no pride. Come forward quickly at the end of the service. And we will cast that deceiving spirit out of you. Because we deal with it. Hallelujah. So they had to get those down to 300 men. 300 men against 120,000. And the 300 men destroyed 120,000. That, those stories are put in the Bible for a reason. It's to show you that in you, you're nothing. And the more you look to God and lean on God, because really, the opposite of pride is humility, and humility is dependence on God. It's a dependence on God. It's our independence, our own arrogance, our own pride that lets us stand up and say, I know, I got this, I got this figured out. And what happens, you can't have a move of God in your life. So if you're going through some tough stuff, sometimes it can be good to find out that, you know what? I need, my, I need God more than I need my, my next breath. But he must increase and I must decrease. Say that. He must increase. He must increase. I, must decrease. I must decrease. Hallelujah. But God always deal, deals with this. And, and, and um, Scripture has a lot of things to say about pride. I don't get into it too much, but I just want to touch on some things. It talks about the Bible. says there are seven things the Lord hates. Yea, six are an abomination. And he starts off with the proud look, number one, the proud look, the proud look. That's why I don't enjoy, I make people go through the mission school because the worst thing you can do as an American, you go over to a foreign country and the people aren't educated like you, don't have what you have. And you can get a strut. You can turn into an ugly American. And I've heard preachers, I've got to go back and pick up where they trashed people. They say, you need to have prosperity, a green bean out of a Bible school. You need to have prosperity. You need to have a, my God, they're walking. You know, your prosperity for them would be a bicycle. And, and, and where they run people down, they feel like that they're, I know, I look at, like when I go to Africa, an African in the bush 
can have more tenacity for God than you as American with all your Bibles on your shelf and your AC blowing in your face. In fact, I love Africa so much because tell me a people. I think they're the toughest people on the earth. Tell me a people that in the cold, dark night is raining will walk five miles one way to go to the service. And then when they come back, they'll turn around and walk the other way. I don't know the people. Are the Koreans going to do it? Maybe the closest. They're pretty tough, the Koreans. Are the Mexicans going to do it? No. <laughs> are any Europeans going to do it? The whole, are, the Europe, are, are you serious? Never. They don't want to get water on their beamers. <laughs> you go through, I, I, I go through all the peoples of the world. Maybe I'm prejudiced. But the African. I remember one time, were you with me on that? We were in Samba. There was like a house. There was a river gorge. And I saw them way off in the horizons of houses. I said, we got to go over there. So we took the bread. And we had walked for like a mile or two. Then we had to climb down this cliff face. Had a four river. Climb up a cliff face. And they just keep on going. We just kept on going. I had a couple of young guys with me. I was training them. I come inside this house and we share Christ. We, you know, we gave them the bread and we had a great time. Prayed for them. And, and I told this older lady, I said, we're having a service tonight and I pointed way over there it's, it, you know, that's, it's going to be there well it was raining that night it was cold I about fell out there she is in the front row I said I feel humbled I mean I don't know if I would do that personally I'm not sure I would do that based if I lived there and that trouble and then when we got done around 9.30 and I said can we go back with you no I'm fine they just take off in the dark. No flashlight. It's dark. It's raining. It's cold. I said, Jesus, I've got to grow up. I've got to grow up. I've got so much to grow up in. So you've got to be so careful. Your pedigree. Now, I'm originally from England. The English are into pedigree. Gag me with a spoon. It's all about who you are, what your family line is. It's a pecking order. That's why we left. No. <laughs> John, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, have you gone to eat? Oh, you went to eat? Mm. Yes. That's why you drink tea with your pinky in the air that you know your culture. Everything they do, everything you do, it's your pedigree. I like they'll watch you. How you handle your meal will determine your social standing. They'll look at you. Mm -hmm. Lower caste. <laughs> you're, you're slurping. If you're a slurper, you just drop three levels. Come on, I'm not, listen. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad my parents became missionaries. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And so it says, the Bible says, uh, Proverbs 13, 10, only by pride comes contention. Think about the, the contention that's in our world today. Racial contention, class contention, all the stuff that's called contention. Snarky one against snarky two. Just contention. Only by pride comes contention. That's the only reason it's here. Because we believe that our way is the better way. And we're, we have the answer to life. Proverbs 21.4. This is a big one. A high look and a proud heart in the eyes of God is sin. So you have to see this that God says to us, I want you to understand this, that when the more you empty yourself of you and you fill it with the word, you got to get off your own dependence and totally lean on me. And so the root of worry, concern, I'm so concerned, I'm worried. 
The root of that really is pride. Because you lean on yourself to fulfill what you need to do. Amen. Now, I've got a scripture for this. 1 Peter 5.5. 5. He talks about the fact that we need to submit to one another and clothe ourselves with humility. You've got to do it yourself. Clothe yourself with humility. Because God resists the proud but gives grace unto the humble. There's an ability that comes to the humble. And I'm telling you, the greatest men I'm, I know in the kingdom, that I know particularly overseas, their humility is a mark of who they are. Their character, they're, such, they're humble people. And their churches would blow any of American churches away. This is not a church in America that has over 100,000 people. Yet I deal with people, uh, one building, three kilometers square, three, four million people meet for one week. What church in America has three, four million people? I think God holds them back because of being on Charisma magazine and every other magazine. But the greatest ministers I've found have been ministers overseas. In Seriously. I'll deal with a pastor in China. Full of joy. I don't even know his real name because everything's a code. They gave me a name. I didn't even know it. So your Chinese name is, what was it? Hopesha? My name is Hopesha. They yell at Hopesha. I'm still just walking. Hey, Hopesha. Underground church. And he sits there and he just talks and he talks. And he talks about his times in prison. Uh, talk. I'm sitting around eating a table with all these directors that cover all of China. It's an underground church. And they've spent time in prison. They've suffered for God. They're full of joy. And they talk about when I went to heaven. Everybody's been to heaven at least once. They've seen Jesus. Jesus talked about the ministry. And when he said, at one time I was called by the Father up to heaven. And he was upset with me because he said, get the rest of China. And I didn't want to do it. And the Father corrected me and sent me back down. But I just love him. Then they go into a dance. Let's dance. Get up in the morning. Let's all dance. We all dance. And the Chinese dance is different. I loved it. We're going back in Jesus' name. But the humility, but great power. They cover the whole, you know, 1.4 billion people, four times our size. And their life, they just live it like, you know what? My life's not my own. I don't really care. I, I just live it just sold out to God. But the Bible says, in that that, and First Peter 5, then you go to 6, it says, but cast all your care upon him because he cares for you. Casting all your care. Why? Because when you're dealing with God, when you carry the weight on yourself, then it's on you. Then your own pride is saying, I got this. And God says, no, no, no. Get over in the closet. Give it over to me 100%. Lay down your pride. Understand it's me in you. The treasure is of God, not of you. It's going to be my power that's going to put you over. I promise you this, if, if you're depressed, you got ulcers, wait a minute, you need to get in the closet, give it to God. You're trying to carry it on yourself. And it's, and it's like an, a weird thing. No, I got I got no, I got no, no, God says, I don't want you to have it. I want you to give it to me. I want you to lean on me. And the more you lean on me, the more I can do through you and for you. There are times, I remember in the business world, I get so, you know, you have, I don't know if you've had this happen in the business world. All things are building up. You're in a hurry. I haven't really prayed like I want to. I'm going into work. i got all this thing. I remember being in the, in the, in the driveway and saying, God, this is bigger than me. I've got to have your help. I lift my hands up in the car. And then here comes the presence of God. Here comes the glory of God in the car. I said, Lord, I didn't pray this up, fast it up, but I asked you to help me. And here comes the anointing of God. And then the day is a wonderful day where you, where you knock the devil in the head and you win the victory. It's the same in church work. I tell you, in any kind of, if you're going to minister, if you're going to minister, you've got to be in dependence on God. And if you're not, you won't last long. I just see people, they, they charge off in their own strength. And next thing you know, 
they quit. Next you know, they get offended. Next you know, you can't last because you're not that good. You'll get offended at me. I promise you, the devil will get on you. You'll get offended at me. And it won't be, where'd he go? They felt led to go somewhere else. That's fine. Go where you need to go. But I'm telling you this. If God didn't send you, it's not the best. Really, God was still doing the work in you. And it's when we hold it on ourselves. You know, I, I've, I've just found the greatest way to walk is just get lower. Just keep getting lower. No, God, I don't know anything. You know everything. I don't know the answers like I, I, I should, but you do. But I'm looking to God. But I found out the more I do that, the more I say, God, I'm nothing. You're everything. And I call upon the power. Here comes the power. Here comes the grace. Hallelujah. Is everybody still out there? And so we need to, we need to, we need to understand that this is a, a lifestyle that God has for us. That we live totally dependent on God. And Jesus said this out of Luke 14, 11. He says, he that exalts himself shall be humbled. But he that humbles himself shall be exalted. So all I got to do about, you know what, God? I want to find ways that I can humble myself. This, I just find ways to do it. Now, sometimes it's not always the greatest. You get humbled. You say you want to get humbled? I remember one time we were in the Philippines. We'd, we'd flown all day, landed in Japan. Back then, Marcus was in power. And when I left, Aquino was in power. So there was, when we got to the airport, there were guns out everywhere. They said it's going to be a little bit tense. It's kind of not the safest for Americans. But we went anyway. We're in, getting into Cebu on a boat, and we, gotta take a, we took a boat all the way to the island of Leyte. Leyte is the island that, that General MacArthur landed on in World War II when he returned to the Philippines to liberate the Philippine Islands from the Japanese occupation. So we're out there. We pull into this. It was like at night. It was like a, a vintage freighter, an old freighter, rusted. We were on the top level. All you had was cots. The downstairs was full of animals and people. That was like, I guess we were considered the first class. And the rest was just filled with animals. And everybody, everybody just brought their goods. And it was a crazy hour at, at night. Like we left at 10 o'clock at night. It was like, took us six hours. Got there about four in the morning. So we pull into this dock, this itty bitty dock, like one little pier, this little freight. Doom, 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 doom. And there is our vehicle. It's going to take us to Villaba, about a three hour ride down the island. So we get out, it's got one little street light. Well, there are donkeys up and down this place with carts because kids, they're going to put their stuff in the carts and take off at about four in the morning. So we get out there, we, we lay all our stuff down. There's about five of us. And so I almost said, I'm going to practice humility. I said, it was, a, it was an old Toyota with glass and the back was all sealed. I will take the back seat. I took the back seat with one other brother. We're sitting back there. Now, here's what happened. I did not know this, but they had laid a lot of the suitcases in the discharge of the donkeys. Then they had stuck those things in the back, and we're in the back. And they shut up. Now, you understand it's high humidity. It's hot. And it's me. And my again, as soon as I got back, they said, this humble thing is really going to go to another level. <laughs> when I breathed in the nitrogen off that, off that smell and all the other things on those cases, and we cried out for the people up front, open as many windows as you can because we're gagging back here. And they thought it was funny, but we didn't. And I remember, I say, no, Lord, this is good. This, this is good. We're going to learn humility because I'm going to take the last place. The guys up front had air. We didn't for three hours. Then we get out there. Then we get down there in the, in the morning. Then we're there, and we're going to be showed a place where we're going to stay. Now, this is a primitive village. To take us upstairs in this wood is like ancient wood, very crumbly. So I didn't realize this, but they, they, everyone raced up there and got their beds. There were single little itty bitty beds. But I was languishing too long. And I get up there, 
And the bed they had for me was like a twin, it was like a bed, I don't know what size it is, like a twin bed, like four and a half feet across. And I had to share it <laughs> with a man that, um, that was uh, heavy. I said, God, this is more humbling stuff. I had to learn, when, when he got in the bed, it formed the Grand Canyon. I'm not making this up. So what I had to do, I would sleep on the edge of that with my one arm down as a breaker. Because if ever I got into the canyon... The danger of being rolled over and suffocated was very high. Very, very high. These things I'm not making up. And uh, we became pretty close, that man and I. <laughs> Actually, he's recently deceased, so I can really tell stories on him now, but... You have to make a decision. You're going to do things on purpose that will take you down the notch and make yourself do things that you don't want to do. Does that make sense? Like this place, Wexford, over here. I said, I'm going to call on every single house, knock on every house. I'm going to tell them, Hell is hot. Heaven is not. Make a wise decision. No, I wouldn't. I didn't say that, but I would. But I, but I took a survey and I asked them just simple question. I went through this whole Wexford place. And I had some people help me. What I did most of us, it's like 460 houses. And some people didn't like me because just, you're the pastor of that church. We don't like that church. What have we done to you? We just don't like you. Okay. One guy tried to roll me over the lawnmower. He got so upset with me. He took a lawnmower at me. And he said, I'm calling the police. I just call him. I'm friends with him. <laughs> so, uh, but most people would, you know what? Most of Wexford, here's what I got out of Wexford. You know, those who, are, who knew the Lord. I prayed for, I figured it was 10%. I paid for like 46 people. But Wexford, those who knew God said, no, we respect the fact that we're blessed. God has blessed us in this home. And we had a good, and they went to different churches. But we invited people to come. Amen. But the main thing is we want to get them saved. Amen. And so I did that on purpose. I said, I'm going to do the whole thing. Is it always, I'm the pastor, I don't need to do that. No, let me tell you something. I'm not above that. I want to be, uh, you'll find me on the streets of Roswell. I'll be on the streets. I will be downtown. I am never going to say, that's for you to delegate, but I'm the pastor. We'll not do it. Amen. We'll not do it. I refuse to do it. Amen. And I understand, you know, praise the Lord, whatever. I don't mean to get an accolade here. I don't have to, have to cast that down. But anyway, that's just, <laughs> but the point is this. God says, clothe yourself with humility, submit to one another. This thing about walking with God, with this thing, God, I don't need to increase, you increase. And Paul had so much to say about this. Now I've got to get going. I just feel like I've just been just going slow. But I'm not going slow. I'm just following God. I'm just not going slow. Philippians. Listen, listen to Paul in Philippians. Philippians 3. Listen to his heart. Verse 3. Oh, no, oh, no verse um, 4. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks... He may have comments in the flesh. I am more so. I'm circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, 
a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, wow, these I've counted loss for Christ. And indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Wow. Listen, Paul. Paul said, you know what? I've had the highest accolade of my society. I've got the PhD. Gamaliel was my teacher, which was the number one teacher in that time. I was the man. But when I accepted Christ, I was spurned by all those who used to look up to me, and I became the offscouring of the world. He says, I count everything that the world says to me is great as nothing. I could care less. I count it as zero. Because he understood the treasure. He was the one that said the treasure is the Holy Spirit inside of you. It's the Spirit of Christ inside of you. That's the treasure. And he talks about people getting puffed up. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he talks about people that get puffed up. 1 Corinthians 8, he says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And then he goes on the next verse. I love it. He says, let me read it so I don't mess it up. I want to get exactly as he said it. 1 Corinthians 8. He says, not concerning things. Um, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Now, here, now, now listen, listen to what he says. If anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing. Yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. If you think you know something, yet you know nothing. Compared to what God has and knowledge for you and what he has. I mean, uh, the more you know about God, you find out how little you really know about God. That's where my heart's at. Amen. And then he goes on to say other things too. He's got so much to say. In in 1 Corinthians 2. He said, my speech and my preaching were not with uh, persuasive words or human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He's always deflecting to God. He says, some say I'm of Apollo. Some say I'm of Peter. I'm, I'm of, you know, uh, I'm of this one, I'm of that one. He said, let me tell you this. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So it's not a me that's one to doing the planting. It's not about Apollos doing the watering. It's about God who gives the increase. He says, when you focus on God, it's his work. And whatever we do for God, we have to realize it's his spirit in us. And without him, we couldn't do it. So that needs to go to him. And when we talk about I must decrease, he must increase. He must increase in my adoration, in my praise, in my commitment, in my devotion. Because he must increase. But I must decrease. And religious pride gets in the way. And all the judgment. You know what? It's like God says, if you'll understand, the place of rest is when you're understanding that it's of me, not of you. It's of me. Is everybody still out there? He said, now some of you, verse, uh, this is uh, chapter 4, verse 18. Now some of are puffed up as they're not coming to you. But I'll come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Now, you know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 that love doesn't vaunt itself. Love is not puffed up. Love doesn't parade itself. And, but we have to guard against the puffed upness. 
always know this, that someone offends you, I'm, I'm offended. What's been touched is your pride. Let's just get real. Your pride. And how we process the offense should be, Lord, I forgive that person, but let me work that it shouldn't affect me. Does that make sense? It should just bounce off me. And I shouldn't go into three months depression. I have to take Prozac, drop out of the church, get upset with the pastor, and lose your whole walk with God over one offense. Because really the root of that is pride. The root of it is you touched your pride was touched. Now, you won't call it that. You'll call it something else. You call it, I'm not taking stuff from people. I'm, not, I'm my own man. I'm not going to put up with that. People aren't going to do that for me, I mean, against me. But I tell you, we've got to be so careful. Guys, we, gotta, we just got to walk low to the ground with God. You, but you can be full of power. I found out this. There is an equation here. The greater the humility, the greater the anointing. And the greater the longevity. I believe that Moses was taken by God 40 years in the wilderness to pound out self-reliance, independence, because he was trained at the highest school. He had the greatest clout. He knew everything. He was going to be great. He would be the next Pharaoh. And he had to have an encounter with God. That bush experience with the fire of God changed him and changed the nation. When you get to the place where you've got to say, God... It's going to be all of you and none of me. And so, like pastoring this church, I don't need to pastor a church. Do you understand that? Some people know oh, i got to pastor a church for the recognition, this and that. That's never been my heart. It took God a year to talk me into pastoring. I said, please, send somebody else. Please, I'll, I'll, I'll tithe more, I'll give more. Just leave me alone, God, leave me alone. But God would not leave me alone. And he dealt with me. He said, no, you are. There's a balance in this between laity and the, and the fivefold. I've, I, I don't like where everybody thinks fivefold. I'm fivefold. And people are fivefold and I'm fivefold. And what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. In one sense, it doesn't matter. But at the same time, when you're called, if Jesus genuinely calls you, there's an anointing on that call. Now, we're not here to... Make big of it because we should be the greatest servants. And it's not about us. We should deflect it to him. If it, it, if it deflects to me, I know some people put their pictures everywhere. <laughs> but really big. And I get that this identity and it, that's my pastor. I understand it. But sometimes I've seen there's a large church in town. The pastor's not even on the planet anymore. You walked into the thing. There was this gigantic poster of the pastor. Like this. I mean, huge. It took over the whole church. I said, oh my. Oh my. I think we went over the top on this one. Oh my goodness. And if anybody's been in ministry, you know what I'm talking about. We've watched it happen. So all I know is, you got to remember, make it a prayer. I must decrease, but he must increase. I must decrease. And we sing that song, lower, lower. Yeah, Lord. But the greats, they had it. The greats. Smith Wigglesworth, he had it. It was a constant saying, Lord, less of me. More of you. Less. I need less, less, less of me. Less of my sensitivity. Less of my touchiness. Less about what about me. Less of me. Just, just you, Jesus. More of you. And then he closed with a line. He says, until it's none of me. It's all of you. So whatever happens to me, you get the praise. Whatever I do, it glory goes to God. Because I have the treasure in earth, earthen vessels. I'm nothing outside of you. I tell you, when you walk this way, you don't, you don't, you're not a touchy person. Sense of getting hurt all the time. People get hurt all the time. Listen, life will hurt you. 
But when you walk in the presence of God, there's a, the Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous shall run to be safe. There's protection in his presence. There's, there's healing in his presence. This glory of God. God wants to outflow. That this, it's like, I just want to bless people with the anointing, the Holy Ghost. He says, I want to pour out my spirit. I want to touch him with the fire. Let this, it's, but don't you touch it. Don't be Uzzah. Never touch the cart. Don't touch the ark. Don't touch it. Don't touch, don't touch the glory. No, 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 no. Don't do it. But if you'll be humble and recognize this, the treasure is of him. It's of him. Then we focus more on him. Then he can do more through us by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Oh, I love these white aisles. We, take out, we took out all these aisles because we have to be COVID compliant. But you young people, you're going to learn this early. So you don't get the big head. Especially when the Bible says, you know nothing like you should know. Basically saying, stay a learner. The danger of young people, they find they have little knowledge, little experience, all of a sudden they know more than anybody else. And they can't receive. All of a sudden they shut down. Because they know so much. No, you don't know the things you should know like you should know them because there's more that God has for you. Amen. So Paul goes on to say, listen, there's one thing I do, forgetting those things you are behind, reaching for those things are ahead. I press toward the mark of the prize high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Here's what I said in Philippians 2. He said, you know what? Don't just look after your own things, but look after the things of the other people. Not just your own interests. Look at the interests of other people. It's the whole heart of Jesus Verse 5 is that he had the mind, the Bible said the mind of Christ, that was the mind of Christ, that he became obedient even to the, be a servant to humanity. He emptied himself. The Bible said in Philippians 2, he emptied himself of all of his heavenly privileges. If anyone could, I mean, he is our example. He emptied himself of what he could have done. Can you imagine, Jesus, Son of God, think about the humility in him where these Pharisees are going, who says things that you're God? I mean, you're, 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 you're from the devil. I mean, you know, Jesus could have said, you want to see something? <laughs> I mean, he, could have, he said, watch this. Temple opens up. We lose three priests, close it back up. You were saying? What were you saying? Were you saying something? But he just, but he lived a life of just restraint. He lived a life that said, no, no, you know what? It's about my father. I just want to be yielded, submitted. It's about taking my clothes off and washing the feet of 12 disciples, including the traitor that would turn me in that I'd be crucified by. Wow. He emptied himself. So you know what? We need to have our lives. You understand this? We're programmed for self-centered selfishness. You understand that? When you're born in this world, if you starve as a baby, pet me, feed me, it's all about you. And some parents never break it on their kids. They grow up, they just raise little, little monsters. And uh, screaming, like I was at a restaurant today. And uh, this kid's just screaming and screaming and screaming. Look at him, okay, this, you're allowed two minutes, maybe five minutes, what's going on here? Take the kid out. Either it's sick or it needs a spanking. One of the two. But don't sit there. Ah! Ah! The whole restaurant is saying, seriously, we're going through this. You say, well, how could you say that? Well, I raised three kids and we learned that There's, there are limits to your screaming. Okay, that's enough. When my wife said, that's, stop it. I said, stop it. I don't want to hear anymore. <laughs> Little kids understand stuff. They don't need rhythm. They just need a spanking. They need love <laughs> of God. Don't get me started on the drug stuff, but we're going to, we're, we're, uh, we're tying down here. There's so much more. I'll just let it go. I am crucified with Christ. Yet unless I live, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Wow. Lord, I want your anointing. I want your power. Wow. 
They're not going to decrease. He must increase. That's it. That's a nugget. I must decrease. He must increase. I've got to have increased more in my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The presence of God is wonderful. Isn't it? He comes to touch people. He comes to touch you. He comes to free you. That treasure. And he wants it loosed in every one of us. That the loose, the power of God's loosed to help people. Come here, my sister. How are you? Hallelujah. The power of God comes on you. Raise your hands. They're going to heal you right now. Lord, I just release your power upon her body. Let that anointing fire flow in her. We loose the treasure that's within us. The anointing would come upon her life. Free her of all pain. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. God's going to give you strength for your latter days. You're not going to get weaker, you're going to get 